Hi folks and welcome back. This is part two of my Land Rover conversion video. In the last video you saw me go through the storage units uh, on one side of the Land Rover and the kitchen unit with the, with the stove and the lift up flap. Um, I also went through some of the steps I took to get the Land Rover ready, removing seats, putting in a new side facing seat and replacing the old tatty saggy headlining. In this video I'm going to take you through all of the other conversions and additions I've made so far. To begin with, I added some additional storage for tools on the opposite side to where the main storage unit is. There's a lift up worktop with a, a sort of flap lid um, and inside is a compartment for keeping a toolkit, which is pretty essential if you own a Land Rover. This is just a simple box made from plywood and covered in headlining carpet just like the other unit. I also covered the wheel arch in the same material. Also on this side of the Land Rover, I made a plywood panel to cover over the rear window blank. Originally this vehicle had rear sliding windows. They were rattly, leaky and horrible. So I removed them and blanked them with aluminium sheeting. The back door was the next area I tackled. The original door card was looking very tired. So I used it as a template and made a new plywood door card and covered it in headlining fabric. I then made up a shallow hinged box that I mounted onto the door card with a door that drops down and is held in place with steel cable. This creates a shelf, which is perfect during the summer to put my stove on. I can move the stove from inside the Land Rover, put it on that shelf on the back and I can cook outside in the sunshine. It's not quite finished. I plan to make a spice rack, which sits in this little area above where the stove is and that'll hold various dried herbs and spices for cooking, but that's a job for another day. For flooring in the back, I needed something that was practical and hard wearing. You know, I'm moving heavy bits of equipment around in this Land Rover and I needed something that would withstand large items being slid in and out of the back. The floor is made up from two layers. There's a thick rubber matting, which is bonded down to the Land Rover floor. And this is a five mil thick recycled rubber used by horse owners in stables. On top of that is a hard wearing rubber matting with this checker plate pattern for added grip when it's wet and muddy. This thinner top layer is removable. So if I wear it out, it's easy enough to replace. Next up was window coverings. I wanted to have curtains all the way around in the Land Rover for privacy and for insulation. It makes a huge difference in the summertime. You can wind the windows down, draw the curtains across and it stops that belting sun from, from coming in and heating up the inside, but still allows plenty of ventilation. It keeps it much, much cooler. In the winter, obviously has the opposite effect. Keeps that, uh, keeps that warm air trapped in, keeps it much warmer in here with the heating on. Along the top of each curtain, I sewed some thin webbing and these hold a load of these nylon rings. I bought these off eBay and they're actually used in the manufacture of bra straps, but they are perfect for this. It just glide along simple neck curtain cable fixed at each end to holes drilled in the Land Rover trim. I added fixed tiebacks so they can be stowed in transit and I sewed in rare earth magnets at the other end to keep them in place when the curtains are drawn. The front screen is just covered with a Reflectix panel for now. I do plan on making curtains for it. It's another one of those jobs on my list. The original factory fitted courtesy light was never gonna be enough in here. So I added some additional lighting. I replaced the single ceiling light with a better quality, brighter LED version. And I added another one just inside the back door. These are much better, much brighter and uh, independently switched. I also added some LED strip lighting at low level and one at high level creating a sort of up lighter. And these give off a nice cozy ambient light in the evening.
For power in here, I'd originally planned on installing a leisure battery with a split charging system, so the battery could be charged while I'm driving along, and that would power lighting and a few sockets for charging up electronic devices and things like that. But in the end, I decided to go down the portable route. It's much simpler. I have a portable power unit, which I can use in the Land Rover when I'm in here. I can take it indoors. I can use it in the house if we have a power cut. Um, I can take it out camping with me to the beach, whatever. It's a completely portable unit. It's a 500 watt power unit from Power Oak, and it's got loads of outlets on it both 12 volt and 240 volt, so you can power just about anything you need, as long as it doesn't draw too much. But you know, certainly for laptops and electrical devices and things like that, I can charge all my camera gear, you know, anything I need, it's perfectly adequate for. I tend to charge it up at home before I go on a trip, but I can also charge it as I'm driving along from the vehicle battery, and for off-grid charging, it's got a great big four-part solar panel. So on a nice bright sunny day, that's plenty of power to, to keep it topped up. It's a really good bit of kit. Next up is sleeping. I played around with loads of different ideas for a bed for in here. And to be honest, unless it's an emergency, it's only ever gonna be me and possibly Maggie, my dog. Um, so it didn't need to be anything too elaborate, to be honest. I played around with the idea of using one of those military fold out cots. Um, where it would kind of be fixed to the side of the Land Rover and fold up out of the way in the back when not in use, but I just couldn't make it work. So I took a step back and I decided to go down the hammock route. I like hammocks. I find them really comfortable. I sleep in them often when I'm camping. So it made sense just to create a means of hanging one up in here. I bolted two steel eyes to the Land Rover, one at the front and one at the back, and they're just the right distance apart to hang up an old DD Scout hammock that I wasn't using anymore. So that has now become my Land Rover bed. The front eye is fixed through the flange where the windscreen bolts onto the roof panel of the Land Rover. And I had to make a little hole in the head lining and it's just big enough to hook the shackle I used to hang my hammock through it. On the back of the Land Rover, I bolted a length of box steel and the eyelet is then bolted to that. So the load is spread across that panel above the back door and it's good and strong. This swivel seat is a new addition. I've wanted to put one of these in for ages so that I can rotate the passenger seat around and create a bit more space and a comfortable seat for sort of sitting in, lounging in, in the back of the Land Rover. There isn't one available for Land Rover Defenders because of the shape of the seat box. So I had to buy one for a Ford Transit and then modify it. I had to do a bit of re-drilling and things and make it fit. This is the problem you have when fitting a swivel base in a Defender, is this seat box, which slopes backwards. Um, and the reason for that is that normally the seat sits directly on that, and it gives you that correct position for traveling, you know, slightly tilted back, comfortable. Um, the problem is, is when you use a swivel base, that needs to be as close to flat as possible. Um, otherwise, by the time you've spun it around facing the back, the seat will be tilting forwards and it isn't going to be very comfortable. So what I did with this Ford Transit swivel base is I packed the back of the swivel base up using some steel bar to get it a bit more level and then to compensate for that bar I packed the front of the seat up off the swivel base to maintain that correct forward traveling angle. There is one drawback in that I have to open the passenger side door slightly in order for it to revolve. It just hits the door unfortunately but it's a small price to pay for having that extra comfort in the back. And then finally, the most recent addition and the thing I'm most excited about, especially today. Land Rover heating is notoriously terrible um, and obviously it only works when the engine is running anyway. So I wanted to have some sort of auxiliary heating in here that I could use to preheat the interior of the Land Rover in the winter before I drive it to work, defrost the windscreen, that sort of thing, and that I could use as a night heater. So when I'm camping in here, when I'm sleeping in here, during the winter, it will keep me warm. I'd looked at the expense of German and Japanese diesel heaters, and I'd almost committed to buying one when I was introduced to these cheap Chinese diesel heaters. They seem to have such a big following. This heater is a beast. It's an independent diesel heater 
that runs off its own diesel tank or you can plumb it into your existing vehicle diesel tank if you want to I just didn't fancy drilling a hole in mine and it's a blown air heater blows hot air through through a vent and warms up the inside of the inside of the vehicle the exhaust is all vented outside so there's there's no you know worries about um, dangerous fumes and gases getting into the into the vehicle itself and it's thermostatically controlled so I can set the uh, temperature I want and it'll just run until it hits that temperature and then just go into a tick over mode. One of the best features for me is that it comes with a remote control so I can turn it on 10 minutes before I want to go to work from the comfort of my warm house and uh, when I go out to the Land Rover it's warm, the windscreen's defrosted if it's icy and, uh, and it's, yeah, it's nice and cosy. These heaters are really cheap. The one I installed costs about £95 and that includes all of the fixing kit, the diesel tank, everything. The company I got it from is called Max Beading Rods and I'll put a link below. Um, the company have very kindly given me a promotional code as well for you guys, for you viewers. So if you're interested in getting one, check out the, the code, the discount code in the description box and it'll give you an extra 17% off. So <laughs> for something that's already cheap as chips, it's just almost silly, isn't it? This is the heater itself and it fits nicely in the driver's side under seat storage locker. Um, fresh air is drawn from outside so I've drilled a hole in the back and put a, a vent over it to stop insects from coming in so all the air that comes through and is pumped into the Land Rover is coming from outside um, and then it goes through this ducting here and then into the back of the Land Rover. It's enough to heat the whole space up in very little time. Underneath the Land Rover I hope you can see that right. We've got the exhaust, so that comes out through the bottom of the heater and then out through a silencer and that just vents through that little exhaust port there. This black one over here is fresh air in, that's combustion air coming in. This green line here is uh, the fuel line, the diesel fuel line. And then in here, behind the kitchen units, I've got the diesel tank. This is the tank that comes with it, it's a slimline tank, just happened to fit perfectly in here, holds 10 litres and we've got the pump and filter and obviously all the diesel lines and power to the pump. I've suspended the pump with cable ties and that's to keep the sound down a bit. This is probably the noisiest part of the heater, obviously you can hear the, the fan in the actual unit itself, there's not a lot you can do about that, but the clicking of this can be quite irritating, a lot of people comment on it, um, by hanging it and not bolting it to the side of something rigid, you can cut that sound down considerably. I can hear it now because, you know, we're right here next to it, but when this door is shut and I'm inside the actual Land Rover itself, you can, you can barely hear it. So if you get one of these and you find that the clicking is a pain, just hang it, making sure it's at the right angle. That heating is very welcome today. It's about minus one outside and it is lovely and toasty inside. Well, that's where I'm up to with the conversion so far. It's, it's not done, it's not finished. And if I'm honest, it probably never will be. Uh, it's like with all of these things, you know, you, you, you constantly think of new things to do, new things to add and, and improve. And that's very much the case with this. I'm gonna add a second battery with a split charging system, just as a precaution for when I'm using the heater overnight. Um, there's space in my battery box and somebody very kindly sent me the, the split charger. So I'm gonna put that to use and, uh, and get that organized. Whether I get a second vehicle battery or a leisure battery I don't know I'm not sure whether the split charger will work will work with a, a leisure battery or whether I'd be better off just having a second vehicle battery in that way I've always got power to start the vehicle I'm definitely going to make a proper curtain for the front windscreen and I may as yet put in an onboard water tank with a pump and everything but I'm still a little bit undecided that might be a bit that might be a bit much it might be a bit too high tech for this build but I'm really happy yeah I'm really pleased with how it's all come out I'm really pleased with how it all all works yeah it's good I'm looking forward to lockdown being over so I'm hoping to get out on an overnight camp in this a sort of stealth camp so you can see everything sort of like working properly thanks for watching and I'll see you soon